When you hear the name Shockey, you know something great is on the horizon. This week on Wild Talk, we're thrilled to be joined by the one and only Branlin Shockey. Branlin has spent decades telling hunting adventures through his eyes behind a camera, and we're diving into his latest project with Cam Haynes, Once Were Wolves. Later in the episode, we'll catch up with our friend Kate Rundle for our social segment, and Megan from Savage Arms will also join us. Sit back and enjoy this action-packed episode of Wild Talk. We are back with more Wild Talk. I'm your host, Steve Hamilton. We are back at it for another social segment on Wild Talk. This episode of Wild Talk is brought to you by Aventura Self-Heating Beverages. Enjoy your adventure with the comfort of a hot drink anywhere, anytime. Hornady. Accurate, deadly, dependable. Timber Stoves, the original wood pellet patio heater. And Wild TV Plus, stream the best outdoor adventures on all your favorite devices. All right, and we're back with more Wild Talk. When I mention the name Shockey, everybody knows it. So I'd like to welcome Brandlin Shockey to Wild Talk. Steve, Kylie, thanks for having me. Anytime, my friend. It's great to catch up. It's been a little while since we've had a chance to chat. So looking forward to, to hearing about uh, what's new in, in uh, your world. But for those that don't know Branlin, the man behind the camera, we'll get into that a little bit later. Let's get a little bit about you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So actually, I was going to say, uh, when you say shocky, most people think of, uh, well, nowadays, most people probably think of my sister. But... <laughs> Uh, or, or my dad or my, my mom. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm the, the least known shockey. Uh, I'm often uh, behind the camera. I do a lot of uh, production work, field production and post-production. Have done for a long time, uh, but obviously grew up in the hunting industry. And uh, yeah, I'm just trying to, you know, find my own, find my own way and, and, you know, tell stories for a living, which is. Absolutely. So w- the name, what's, what was it like to, to grow up with it and to be associated with a name like, like Shockey? Yeah. A uh, great question. So, you know, it's funny. I could not have answered that question. Uh, you know, when I was younger, so in, in high school, first of all, going way back, right. To, you know, when I was first growing up and I was, you know, five years old, we were, you know, Shockey was not a name. Okay. Like dad was a nobody. He was, he was just like, you know, nobody knew who he was. Uh, he was starting to get into outdoor writing at that point. But, you know, I remember dad, my earliest memories are him like literally rototillering our, you know, field, trying to, you know, plant crops and, and like grow our own food at our house. Uh, while I would like mom, my mom was, um, you know, taking care of us kids and, and he would basically be this like outdoors person, but not like what you know him today, much more. I don't know what the word is to describe it is, but uh you know, almost trying his hand at, at farming, basically went and ranching when I was a, a young child. Mm. So that changed though, when he got more into outdoor writing, he became a little more known, he got into uh, outfitting, and then he obviously started the Hunting Adventures TV show, the series. And, you know, that was in the, you know, quote unquote, golden age of of hunting TV uh, with, you know, like, like Bill Jordan, Realtree Outdoors and those guys. And uh um, yeah, that was, that was an interesting time, a cool time. And, but honestly, what I remember most about that time is, you know, dad would travel a lot. He'd be, uh, you know, everybody, uh, you know, face the public facing, right. He's one person. And then like within the family, you know, dad was, dad was dad, you know, so we'd hang out, we, we golf and we'd, you know, he, he'd teach me to, you know, shoot obviously, and teach me to fish. He taught me all that, but he also, you know, sacrificed a lot to 
um, you know, achieve the, the goals he set out for himself in the hunting, hunting industry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a name synonymous with hunting. Like you, you Google hunting and chances are it's, it's, it's a shocky that shows up, but you, for the most yeah. part have chosen to stay out of that limelight and, and behind the camera. Uh, so did you ever feel any pressure to follow in the footsteps, so to speak? Yeah. So, so, uh, I did feel pressure, but not from dad. So dad, you know, when he traveled, right. And I mentioned before, and I should have, um, kept going on that, but, uh, he would often take me with him. Right. So he, I, I remember he'd take me up to the, you know, the guiding camps, the territories. And, you know, I, I was just a young kid and I'd sleep with all the cool guides and stuff. And they're just like my heroes, you know, these guys, mm -hmm. toughest guys ever. Uh, and I dream of one day, you know, being like these guys, um, and he'd also, when he traveled internationally, he'd take me on those trips. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know that there's ever like an exact point where I sort of veered away from the, you know, trying to get into the hunting industry, so to speak. But um, I think honestly, it was when I, I started shooting more on cameras, you know, when the DSLR revolution came about and, uh, and I, you know, tried my hand at that and I thought, oh, you know, actually maybe there's something here for me, you know, cause I looked at, you know, dad was so great on camera. Right. And by the way, dad was not great on camera in the, in the very early days. He really had to work on that. But, but, you know, I, he, those are big footsteps, you know, and, and to think that I could step in there as a kid, you know, and be on camera, just like dad was, was tough, but, but, but props to her. Eva did do that. Mm -hmm. She did a lot more on camera stuff. Uh, and, you know, I, probably part of me was slightly jealous at the time, but I, I ended up finding my own way with the, the telling story side was where I really, you know, hit my stride. And we started doing very well on the, you know, in the hunting sort of world, like in the, the, the storytelling world, like the Golden Moose Awards and the Outdoor Channel. And like, I found a lot of, um, a lot of, I don't know, satisfaction, I guess, but I, I was very proud of the work that we did in, that, in the industry at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I, I figured I kind of found my way and I've sort of kept on, kept in that. No, oh, you absolutely did. But you touched on something there that I wanted, I wanted to talk about a little bit later, but it segues perfect. And <laughs> you mentioned you've been fortunate enough to, to travel and experience a ton of different cultures around the world and, and people. So looking back at that, out of all the places you've been, I guess what area or people had the deepest uh, effect on you? And this is going to sound like I'm the most spoiled brat ever, but, you know, I, I got uh, traveled with dad uh, through Africa. And there were some times, you know, in those journeys where I feel like I was, you know, I came back a different person, uh, you know, obviously for, for the better. But um, Nepal was was a big one for me. Uh, so, so, and I've, I've kind of told this before, but um, we were shooting the professional series at the time. And obviously, you know, most people nowadays probably don't remember that series, but uh, it was it was supposed to be a little bit more behind the scenes, right? It wasn't just like, hey, you know, here we are, let's go kill something. It wasn't about that at all. It was it was about you know what else goes into it. Like what are like let's go, hey, we're in this area, let's go explore, let's look around, let's talk to the people here, let's learn about the culture, uh, let's immerse ourselves, you know, in the idea that we are exploring these new places rather than just you know here to to end an animal's life. Even though obviously that's part of what we do as hunters. So. We went to Nepal and um, I've been talking to dad and I said, you know, I think we can do something bigger. I think we can, we can do these professional stories, but you know, we were, they're still hunting, they're hunting shows. And we, and I thought, well, you know, maybe we can push that envelope a little further. Let's not do 22 minutes. Let's do an hour long format. Uh, let's put on the, let's keep it on the outdoor channel, but let's like elevate our storytelling. Um, and there's a, you know, for anybody out there that's, and even you with uh, you guys, probably with the, the podcast, you find this, but uh, there's a big difference between telling a story that's 22 minutes long and telling one that's, you know, 45 minutes long. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so I kind of, you know, sort of <laughs> bet, the, bet my house, which I didn't own a house at the time because uh, dad didn't pay me very much when I was starting, but uh, he, uh, I said, you know, let's, let's go do this. And dad said, okay. So we went to, went to Nepal and we ended up doing a four part series for the professionals. And we used that as a vehicle to, to um, sell the sponsors and say, hey, like we can do this, but we can make instead of, you know, four parts, like let's make it two parts, two hour long parts, let's call it Uncharted. Let's make a new series, you know, and that became the Uncharted series. But on the Nepal trip, um, there was a big thing because on the third episode, 
there was no animal died. There was no kill shot. And we never, I'd never done that before. Right. We'd always, you know, cause a hunting show, you, you, you have a formula, you know, you, uh, I'm not trying to dog this. Like it's, it just is what it is, but you hunt an animal and you're either successful or you're not. And if you're not successful, you don't make an episode. You come back the next year, you know, and you, you become successful. Um, and it, I think it does a few things. A, it creates a sense that, you know, like a hunt has failed. If you don't kill something, I, I don't think that's true. Um, maybe it is in the strictest sense of the word, but it's not in the sense that, you know, we were trying to convey in the story we were trying to convey. Uh, so yeah, the third episode, no animal died. And I remember we were having a discussion with, with dad and with the team. And, and I was like, I don't know how this is going to do. I don't know if people are going to watch this and we're going to get hate mail because they don't see the action, right? Like there's no payoff. Um, but we, we aired that episode and it was pretty dramatic. You know, like a, a rock fell off the mountain almost, uh, came very close actually to, to killing my, my best friend, uh, who was filming and it did hurt the guide that we were with. So there's, there's like action going on. And in hindsight, I mean, obviously I think that people would want to watch that as very, it was a very dramatic episode, but, but yeah, that was when we did that. And that Nepal series was very successful. Um, that was a, probably the first time I was like, okay, I can really do this. I feel like, you know, I can, I can, I don't know, as naive as my thoughts were at the time, like we can, we can do something different that's that's not really been done before and have people understand mm-hmm. us and it be okay. Um, that's what I yeah. absolutely loved about that series is the the authenticity. And I, I've said it before that there, as you mentioned, there is a, a formula with, with most shows, there's a kill or there isn't. And mm-hmm. I love the storytelling behind it. You've had, you and I have had this chat before about there's so yeah. much mm-hmm. more to the, the, the actual pursuit. And I, I watched an interview not too long ago with your dad. It was a real, real short clip and they, he, he, uh, he pulls no punches in his praise for you with the, the uncharted series and uh, actually yeah. calls you the Mozart of the family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, it's yeah. a great clip. Uh-huh. What, what was your driving thought process behind saying we need to tell a different story? Um, yeah. So the honest answer to that is, and you know, yeah, just be super transparent is I didn't love, uh, hunting shows. So I was not, and, and again, not, I'm not taking anything away from them uh, at all. It just wasn't, I, I couldn't sit down and like get through 99% of hunting shows that I would see. And I remember sitting there on the couch with dad and he'd be watching these, you know, DVDs that he ordered or whatever, and, and even his own stuff. Uh, and I just feel like, man, like this, these are, these aren't doing it for me. These aren't exciting. What I would do though, is I would watch movies, you know, I'd watch longer form content, uh, done by people totally outside of our industry. And I would be really motivated by that. So, you know, I mean, it's it, as naive as it sounds like I'd, I'd watch like a, you know, a guy Ritchie film or something. And I'd be like, Oh wow. Like they're they're Those cuts they use are so cool. We have to use those in a, like a professional episode or I'd watch, this is actually this, I really did do this. Um, what did I watch? I watched some horrible Hollywood movie. Like uh, it was like Godzilla or something like, you know, from way back in the day. Right. And uh, they did this like cut where they would look like a comic book. And then they like cut from one scene to the next scene, like in this comic book thing. I just, I was like, Oh, cool. That that's awesome. And you know, I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I, so in the next professionals episode we did, I just put this comic book cut, you know, I had no business being a professionals episode. And, and I think it's in the, Ghana episode in season three, I think, or season two, but yeah, we just, I just threw it in there just because I could. Um, and because I liked it and looking back at it now, it seems, um, I think I could have done a better job at all that, but no, the, the, the change in direction was purely me just, you know, I was kind of like handed to the keys to, a, a you know, a Ferrari and I was doing donuts in the parking lot instead of, instead of going and racing it like everybody else. Um, purely, because, I don't know, just cause that's what interested me. Mm-hmm. I, and, Again, I, I absolutely love your storytelling ability and the, 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 the way you can capture that emotion of, of people and the, the hunt is fantastic and it's, it's different. It breaks the mold and I think that's what really set you guys apart and, and elevated uh, your, your dad and your, yourself to, into the upper echelon of the, the filmmaking and the TV shows. Who was your inspiration? Who was your mentor? Oh, cool. Yeah. I, I didn't have a mentor that I can sort of like, uh, identify. I have people that I look up to, 
Um, and especially in the, so what I did in the beginning, uh, and again, like, don't, this is, you know, I, I was given a lot, right. I was given something that nobody else had, which is access to a very famous hunter, right? Like, a, like, you know, at that time, probably the biggest in the world. And I could tell whatever story I wanted, you know, with him to, to, to an extent. So I had a canvas that almost nobody had access to. So, but putting that aside, um, the, the type of what, what I did to, to sort of a learn how to edit, uh, is I recognized, which I had to, that I had no idea what I was doing. Okay. And I think that is a barrier to almost anything people do nowadays where, or, or back then too, I could have easily said, Hey, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to call up whoever I can that's already been doing it. And they're going to tell me how to make a hunting show. Uh, and I think that in hindsight, that would have been a mistake. And I didn't purposely make that decision. I just didn't really know anybody to call. So I just said, well, I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to go on YouTube, which was kind of a fledgling website at the time. And I'm going to learn how to edit. And I'm going to find other people, doesn't matter whatever industry they're in, uh, that are doing work that catches my interest and catches my eye. And uh, so, so that's what I did. So I just by pure fluke, I avoided, you know, following in the footsteps of people that were already making hunting shows. I think I would have, I would have don't, don't think that I wouldn't have fallen into that trap. And I said, Oh, perfect. Okay. This is what you, you know, you, you build up the stock, you cut to this and then you, you know, you fake everything. And then that's, there's your hunting show. Uh, I could have easily done that, but instead I went on YouTube and I just found a bunch of people that, that I think were doing great work. And they, they, I looked at myself as, as, you know, um, being a creative at the time. And I looked for other creatives doing better work than me. And that wasn't easy. That, sorry, that was very easy to find at that time. So I found, um, I can throw a couple of names out there. Uh, a guy named, uh, and nobody will know who this is, uh, a guy named Solomon Lithelm. He has no relation. He's, I've, you know, tried to reach out to him before just because I think he's awesome and his work is incredible. Uh, I don't think I ever heard back, but he's just a guy, you know, he's from Australia doing work with a, a camera, uh, a Canon, what was it? I can't remember, a Canon 60D. He had a Canon 60D and a Sigma 31.4 lens. So I saw the work he was doing and I thought, and there's no budget stuff, it was just him. And uh, and he's since deleted all his early work he used to do, which I was inspired by. But he, uh, I I went out and I bought a Canon 60D and a Sigma 30 millimeter lens and I did my best to you know, live up to the work, to the art that I'd seen him make. And I never, still to this day, I've never gotten close to what he does. He, nowadays he's in New York and he's, he's directing for, you know, like Adidas commercials, like multi-million dollar things. Like he's, you know, huge, but at that time he wasn't. Uh, so yeah, that, I mean, I mean, I can name a few other ones, I guess, but that he really, um, I know you're looking for like a specific mentor, but really to me, it was just finding people that were, that were doing things that I was inspired by. And that was from any, industry. And I think that, I, you know, I would imagine that relates to just about any kind of creative work that people do. I'd recommend you don't look at, you know, the best Hollywood movie. I would not look at the Hollywood blockbusters. I would look outside of that and say, okay, what are people doing, you know, in Europe? What are they doing uh, in the short film side? What are, they, what are they doing in the commercial work side? And you try and bring things that you learn from those spaces into a different space. Beautifully put. Uh, that's exactly what I was hoping for because you don't have, you, you've got your own style that you've crafted and you've honed it your own way. And to, to me as an outsider, not knowing too much about filmmaking, the way, the way I would do it is exactly that. When I have to do some, some basic edits for, for like social media and stuff, I, I'm looking at YouTube videos. I'm trying to emulate and take bits and pieces that allow me to do my own thing. So that it, it, it's exactly right. It's, if, if you're mentoring under one, you're essentially becoming that style. And that's, it's kind of what I figured with you is it was because you just said it before, you're so vastly different than anything else that was ever seen in the industry. And a lot of people now are trying to emulate your style. So trailblazing is the way to go. Yo, everybody, Kate from Wild TV here, back at it with another social segment here on Wild Talk. We know that the Shockey family is very well known for their expertise in the hunting world, but as we've seen, Branlin shares a bit of a different passion, being behind the camera. So for this week's social segment, we pulled a bunch of deadly videos off the internet that are going to showcase videographers in the wilderness all around the world. Pitter patter, let's get at her. If you could see me now, you'd be proud, but you'd think these you'll be. I'm 
Take more pictures, watch the sunset, live your life like you're the main character of your own movie. Alrighty, everybody, hope you really enjoyed those videos here on Wild Talk. We'll be right back. Alright, thanks everybody for joining us for this sponsor segment. We're joined by Megan Harton from Savage Arms. Megan, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. Just a full disclosure, I own a bunch of these and my wife has one my daughter has a couple so i'm excited to get into this so let's go right from the beginning Great. who started savage arms ah so savage was started by arthur savage actually um around 1894 um and back then he was attempting to win a government contract uh for a new rifle platform um he did not win the contract so arthur did decide to commercialize the rifle and we have Savage Arms. Wow, so it's got quite a bit of history, over 140 yeah. years coming up, 135 100, years. Yeah, 100, yeah, we, you know, we Bunch of years. typically say 125 year plus company. Oh, so, it's, yeah. and, and it's, it's, it's made its mark. So let's talk about where it's made its mark. Where are markets in place for Savage Arms? We want to be a very well-rounded company, you know, so we want to make sure that we're always entering new markets which we have continued to do. Um, so we started as a lever company. Clearly we uh, entered the marketplace with a, with the 110 and, and gone to center fire and that kind of thing. So, um, but over the past five years, we've really launched our innovation, um, you know, full force. We were in the semi-auto shotgun now with Renegade that was in uh, 2019, 2020. Um, to then moving into straight pull rifles with impulse um and those have gone really well with that as well um we're in the handgun category um with stance that's our micro compact carry gun um and then most recently with the 1911 as well so you know we're we're kind of we want to be well-rounded we want to have a gun for everybody um and at a price point that hits everybody everybody's budget and, and you touched on something there that a lot of people wouldn't know about Savage. They automatically think rifles. You touched on handguns there. So yep. that, that's a little piece of the market that kind of opens the eyes to a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. So are, are there plans for expansion in this market? In, in more handguns? It, it just in general. Just in general. Innovation is the name of the game for us. So we're just going to keep continuing to release new and better and more exciting products and yeah, we've oh. got a lot coming down, so it's exciting. Absolutely, as as I as I mentioned, I, I I love this type of stuff. So, how has the company changed since it first came in over 120 years ago? So, I mean, with being a company that's over 125 years old, a lot has changed. Um, we, as a company, haven't moved around a lot, but we've moved three times. Um, we've purchased companies over the years, we've sold companies over the years, but yeah, a, a lot has changed. But innovation, like I said before, is really what we're known for. You mentioned Arthur Savage going back 120, 125 years now. What was his original inspiration for starting the company? Uh, well, I, I said he was trying to do that government contract um, with the new rifle platform, but he, he didn't get that. So um, I think he just he had figured out a way to commercialize it and figured that it was a it was an area that he could excel in and um, and that there were buyers for it. So 
and def definitely shows the, the importance of sticking with a dream, right? Just because you didn't hit it the first time didn't right. mean you can't have a, a, a lifelong legacy that continues into the future. So that's yep. amazing. Yep. It started with one one little drive and expanded from there. Yep. So this is the part I really want to know about. Does Savage have any new and exciting models that we should be looking for coming soon? <laughs> Well, um, I would say that the next two years are going to be jam packed full of, full of new products. Um, most recently we announced the 110 trail hunter. That was, we, that was a product we just came out with and, and, um, very exciting products you won't want to miss out on. I can't, I can't get into too much detail about it, but, um, some, some would be expected from Savage. Um, I, I just, I think people in the market are, are going to be lining up to get these products. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I bought one of the, uh, the ultralight mountain rifles a few years ago and it's, it's a staple. So as we wrap this up, I want to know what's the most popular model of Savage right now and why? I mean, you could probably pick a handful of our one tens that, that just people continue to purchase and ask for. Um, I mean, the ultralight was, was one that we launched and the amount of excitement and um, need and want um, has just has just been astonishing. I, I think you crushed it with that answer. So Megan, thanks for joining us on Wild Talk. I look forward to, to seeing what the, the future of Savage Arms brings. Yeah, keep your eyes out. <laughs> You're not a hunter, are you? Or at least in the public eye? I do hunt. Yeah, I mean, I, I do for sure, but I don't do a lot of it. Uh, but you know, I, I definitely, yeah, 99% of what I do is it, it might be hunting related, but it's not me hunting generally, but I, I'm very for hunting, very pro hunting. I'm, my kids are going to be hunters are going to take them out. You know, if they want to be, uh, we're, you know, I, I love, love fishing, love all that. I just, the, the, the issue for me is that if I'm in a hunting environment, generally I can be of more service if I'm, you know putting a story together. Yeah. And not to take anything away from you, but if you're in a hunting camp with me, I would love to have you telling that story. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Maybe it'll happen one day. Oh Steve. yeah. You, you've got an open invite up here. We got into it a little bit here, but as, as hunters, our message needs to be truthful, authentic and, and real around hunting. And can you dig a little bit more as to how that plays into your style and your work? Yeah, definitely. Well, um, one of the reasons why I didn't like the early hunting shows is because they did do a lot of, uh, you know, I don't think I'm revealing anything here, but there, there, a lot of the stuff is fake, right? Like, especially the early stuff, you know, they, they put your camera in tripods, they, they get what they get probably right on the animal. And then everything else after that was all fake. So they, then they lug the, then they, they have the hunters stay there. They lug the tri or lug the tripod with the camera way in front, you know, where the animal is basically, which you would, could never do in an authentic way. And then like film back on the, you know, the hunter like raising his gun like this from the front, which you'd never do. Uh, and that annoyed me. Um, I didn't think it was true to, first of all, I thought it was, um, I thought it was a little bit maybe disrespectful to the audience, uh, you know, because it's not, it's clearly not authentic. You could never have a camera angle there. And I think the audience knows that. So I didn't want to fall uh, in that style. For sure. So I, I knew that kind of right away. And I think dad also didn't want to follow that in that style. He was, he kind of pioneered, you know, to give him the credit where credit's due, the idea that, you know, you're trying to make sure you capture everything in, in one go. So uh, if you're hunting, you know, there's going to be an animal, it's going to be the the hunter, the guide, whoever's there, you want them all in the same frame. So people know that, hey, this isn't faked, right? In those days, we're not rotoscoping anybody out. Like if we have the animal there and the hunter there, this is, there's nothing fake about that. Right. Dad was very sensitive to that. He, he, he's he's a very, you know, just in general, his, his the, who he is, is a very authentic type person. And he wanted to make sure that we conveyed that. So uh, that was a big part of it. And then just um, I, I don't know, I think the authentic side stuff is just more powerful. I thought that was a weakness in the industry. I thought people were using that as a crutch. You say, oh, we, we can, you know, bake stuff essentially and we can do mediocre uh, we can be mediocre storytellers. And, and so I just thought, OK, well, you know, Let's let's be better than that if we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and speaking of storytelling, uh, we we've touched on it and dug into it that you make some of the best hunting films in the world, and doing it for years, and you've just got that vision that you're able to put onto the screen for people to relate to. 
and you recently worked on a on a film with Cam Haynes, and it was one once we were wolves. I think there's something that's washed in the back of us, this backdrop of modern society, technology, that if it happens, I got help. But there's nothing in Alaska that's like that. So let's chat about that. How did that come about? Yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you. That, that's very nice to, to oh, say all that. I don't yeah. know if that's deserved. Um, so once we're wolves, uh, that was actually something that Kip Falk, so the co-founder of Under Armour, he kind of put that together. Not the, not the actual like, concept of Once for Wolves, but the trip. He's, he called me up like out of the blue and I'd never oh. met him. And he said, I knew, I knew of him, but I've never met him before. And uh, he called me up and said, hey, uh, you want to go on a grizzly bear hunt with myself and Cam? We're going in, you know, whatever. It was like May uh, in Alaska. And I said, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Let's, let's do it. And, um, and so that, that's it. That's what happened. Uh, you know, I, I paid for my own flights up there, but, but Kip, you know, paid for the cost of me being up there. And, and that's, that's really kind of all the expectation was. And so I came up there ready to roll. Cause you know, I, I've, uh, you know, obviously Cam is a huge name now. Um, and speaking of authentic, like Cam is an authentic mm -hmm. person. Right. And not everybody that's well known in the, in the outdoor industry is, but he certainly is. And I've been around enough to know that at the time I figured he was, but, you know, I wasn't hundred percent sure. So I went up there ready to give him my all. Um, and I had uh, my, my one rule I was there was uh, that I was not, you know, Cam is in ridiculous shape. Right. So you're never going to like keep up with him up mountains or anything. But I said, OK, I'm going to stay awake as long as Cam is, because what happens is in Alaska, the uh, sun basically never sets at that time of year. So it just rotates around and you're like a, and like, you're like a rotisserie chicken basically all day long. And, uh, and Cam just barely sleeps at all. You know, he just goes and goes and goes. So I, that was my one thing I'll say is I don't, I never napped or anything when he, when, you know, if he didn't that whole time and he actually, he didn't nap at all, but uh, there's a funny story in that I can, I can tell as well, but um that was a that was not a pre-production thing. There's no thought that goes into it. That's literally just me with the camera going up there. And the only pre-production I did on that was just trying to make sure for, that I could film, you know, being in a tent for that many days with no power. So you're just on a basic, I had a, I've got it here, I think a, a Canon R5 with a 28 to 70 millimeter lens, a couple long lenses. Uh, and then literally like 30 of those power, you know, those power bank things you, you have to charge, you got to charge cameras. Uh, and, and that's it. And we just let whatever unfolded unfolded. And, and, you know, I think a big part of that story working was, um, you know, Cam obviously with, with, with Roy is his friend dying up there a few years prior that, you know, that's what that story is built on, but it's not really about that either. It's about, um, uh, it ended up being about, you know, people gathering together, uh, and doing difficult and potentially dangerous things that, I think, you know, nowadays in society, we don't, and I'm including myself in this, by the way, we don't do enough of that. You know, we don't get the camaraderie that we used to, we get camaraderie or we feel like we do from, you know, likes and people following you, um, conversations you have at Starbucks, but we don't have a lot of the, like, you know, raw, 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 let's go into war type camaraderie that I think comes out a little bit when you're grizzly hunting. Yeah. I completely agree. You 
you kind of hinted that there was a funny story with Cam. You able to tell it? Oh yeah. Uh, okay. So 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 my thing was I'm I'm gonna go out there and you know people were taking naps and stuff because you're you're literally it's like a twenty hour day. You're sitting there just like blasting and it, you can start to nod off or whatever. Cam never did. And I said, okay, I'm not gonna sleep if if Cam's not sleeping. So first of all, I was by the end of the trip, I was like a zombie, uh, and Cam was just just being he was totally fine. This is just what he does all the time. Doesn't sleep, uh, but. What I realized is, uh, so I would add right before he would sleep a little bit. Remember, it's broad mm -hmm. daylight. I go out and set up a time lapse, right? Because I've got an extra R5 and I wanted to get the sky going over. I knew that if we we're going to make a film, uh, it's going to, because it's always sunshine, you're going to want to show the progression of days. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'd set up these time lapses. And, and when you set up a time lapse, I'm sure you know this, but a camera takes a photo, you know, every whatever, 10 seconds or so. And so I went to sleep. Everybody else went to sleep. Cam went to sleep. And, you know, I didn't think much of it. I got back to uh, to my edit suite here, and I brought the footage, and I'm going through everything because uh, that's the first thing I do if I come back and I'm trying to make a film. I like in my mind I have a, a idea of what the story might be, but then I always go through the footage. It's like, okay, this piece might go here, this piece might go here, and I color code it. Like it takes hours, but I looked at the time lapses, and what should happen is it should be just tense, right? It's I going over as you know everybody's inside, but that's not what I saw. What I saw was everybody else sleeping, and I saw Cam getting up every hour and a half to go, <laughs> to go uh, glass. So we're all sleeping. He didn't tell anybody. He just, and, and he was, and the funny part about it is that I would see him in this time-lapse, but you know, up there, you know, he was sleeping in his boxers. So he didn't want to put all his stuff on. So he just get up. So he's basically in his underwear and his boots. And he'd, he'd go out of his tent every hour and a half or every two hours where everybody else was sleeping the whole time. So I thought I'd be, I thought I would stay up as much as he was and working as hard as he was. No, he outworked me the whole time. Uh, and he didn't even, you know, I didn't even know about it until I got back. <laughs> that is not a shock seeing some of his social media posts. The guy's an absolute animal. I don't know how you did it with no naps. I, props to you. I could not have done that. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, again, I don't know how he, he did it because I barely got through without the naps, but uh yeah, he's, he's on another else. level. Absolutely. So I was yeah. going to get into, I know I've seen a couple of videos and not many people I'm sure know this, but you sing and play guitar. I seen that video with Brett Kissel from a couple yeah. months ago. That was super yeah. neat. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? How you got into it? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So like we're talking, I don't know about like a lot of hunting films and what I do, <laughs> um, but I did, I do try to, and from an early age, uh, you know, I've always tried to be as do, uh, I just tried to do creative things, right? I tried to make art with whatever, whatever medium I had. The, the biggest, widest door for me with the biggest step up was of course, you know, my family was, was in the hunting space. Uh, you know, and so again, I'm not some, I'm not trying to say or take credit for, you know, looking outside that space and, you know, and, and then bringing some lessons I've learned from there into hunting that just happened naturally. Uh, but I do other creative things. Um, I write like uh, during COVID here, I wrote like a whole novel uh, for in a children's book. Uh, mm -hmm. I just haven't published any of that or really shared any of that, but, but I have done that. And also I, um, I used to play guitar and sing back in university, uh, but I couldn't write very well. And I, I kind of realized at the time. And so at some point I put my guitar away and I said, okay, you know, we're getting, I'm getting into the hunting space a lot more here. I am, you know, I'm no longer uh, of the opinion that I'm going to make a career being like John Mayer and, and writing acoustic love songs. Like that's not my future. So I put the guitar away, but then, but then recently, um, you know, my mom passed away and uh, for a couple of years there, we knew that she had, you know, it was a grim outlook. She had cancer. And during that period in my life, um, and I think a lot of people probably experienced this, you know, I kind of looked around, I was like, wow, you know, like life really isn't that long. We don't have that long to do what we want to do on this earth. And, you know, a lot of us, um, and obviously myself included, but not everybody, but a lot of us have are, are live very blessed lives, especially in North America, right? Like we have choices about how we want to make a living and we have choices about, you know, who we want to marry and what we want to do in our spare time. And for me in my spare time outside of family and work has always been, you know, I want to do, I want to make art, whatever, in whatever form that is. Uh, and 
the form one of the forms that I, I love obviously is is playing guitar and writing music and um and uh yeah so that's that's i i do that as a side hobby i don't talk a lot about it um but yeah i'm supposed to be recording an album in a month uh brett kissel wants to do that with me uh so we're gonna go up. yeah he wants to go up and do that in in canada and he was very 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 nice and kind enough uh to invite me you know to tour with him for a little bit i did a few shows with him that i think went pretty well and he it was like the coolest thing like you know because you sit here this is you know i i would sit here and play and, and write stuff and then to go from this writing in my little office here to you know sitting on stage with like 900 people and like a legend in canadian country music is sitting beside you playing your song with you and like he's learned the lyrics like taking the time to do that uh that was yeah that was incredible so so yeah very i mean kind of hats off to what he what he's done for me and what he continues to do and, and we'll see where it goes Yes, I've been following along that story for quite some time. And honestly, not going to lie, it was definitely a tearjerker seeing him play the song with you. And I loved watching it. So good job. I loved it. So, Bran, as we wrap this up, I, I want to know what should we expect from you in the future? Okay, well, uh, we'll see where the music stuff uh, leads. So that's 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 one thing, you know, and actually, it's funny, the music stuff, uh, everything I've done up to this point, I'm never in front of the camera, right? Like I'm not I'm not the person that's the focus of attention. Uh, in a lot of ways, that's, you know, a lot easier, right? When you're behind the camera, you don't have to, it's easy for me to give directions. I'm very comfortable in that space. It's more difficult when you're in front of it and you're the center of attention, which obviously playing music you are. So uh, that is something I am pursuing, um, not hopefully at the expense of, you know, providing for my family and, and you know, the projects we have going in the outdoor space. Um, what else? We're doing, uh, I'm trying to capitalize more on the Once Through Wolves type format. So longer form storytelling, kind of more like what you would get in like the surfboarding world or the skiing world. I want to bring those type of high level films uh, into more into like our space because I think our space deserves that. I think there's a appetite for it. And Once Your Wolves, I think, um, is proof of that. Hopefully, you know. So hopefully we can do more of those, and we do have more of the, more of those on the docket. Those are those are hopefully coming up and be shot this year. Um, doing more commercial work. Uh, so you know, trying to again. Um, I think that a lot of anything that I've done in life that you know, has been quote unquote successful, you know, that's only by looking back at it. I've had a lot of failures as well um, because I tend to look at things in kind of like a naive way. So I look at our industry and I look at some of the brands um, and the companies and I look at our people um, and I, I think, well, shoot, I can, I think I can help brands more than, uh, you know, say with the people wearing suits in like LA or New York, you're going to pay a bajillion dollars to, uh, those aren't the creative agencies that we should be hiring. Like they don't, they don't know our people. They haven't done what we do. They, um, it, you know, it, they don't understand us. I think like, like, like we do. So trying to doing more commercial work and we ha are having some successes there. And then also, you know, doing more, still doing series. We're doing uh, uh, season two of the American made series is coming up here. So we're about to start filming that in a couple of weeks, uh, which I'm super excited about. We're going to go fast campers. It's going to be awesome. And then, uh, Season three of that, I think, is coming up. And then we're doing, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I can speak about the exact series, but I think there's something else we're going to be doing with that as well. So we've got a lot of irons in the fire, a lot of projects um, that are that are coming up that excite me um, and that get the creative juices flowing. And, yeah, it's, it's going to be a good year. I, I had no doubt. So uh, I can't remember when it was, but I read a quote that's, that said, success is measured by the number of stories a man has. And you've absolutely <laughs> created your, your own path in the industry. And I cannot wait to see more of the stories from you. So Bran, thanks for joining us on Wild Talk. Thanks so much, Steve and Kylie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I Anytime. appreciate it. It's been, been awesome. This episode of Wild Talk is brought to you by Aventura Self-Heating Beverages. Enjoy your adventure with the comfort of a hot drink anywhere, anytime. Hornady. Accurate. Deadly. Dependable. Timber Stoves, the original wood pellet patio heater. And Wild TV Plus, stream the best outdoor adventures on all your favorite devices.